Church, this, this series, this short series, is two weeks of a series that we're calling Unwrapped. And what we're doing is we're kind of unwrapping some of the miracles and some of the messages, even hidden messages, behind the Christmas story. Last weekend, we talked about Chris, seasons of Christmas, the seasons of Christmas, and we looked at different characters in the Christmas story who were in different seasons of their life because even though we're all in the Christmas season, we're all in individual seasons as well, aren't we? And, and today, I want to talk about the trouble or the troubles of Christmas, the trouble with Christmas. And I want to read again um, a portion of the greatest story ever told, a Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18, where Matthew writes, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. He did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then verse 21 says this, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. We've been singing about it. We pray in that name. We declare that name over our homes, over our families. There is power. There is restoration. There are miracles in that name. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to be your savior, which is what you needed and I needed. He didn't come just to be your friend, although he is our friend that sticks closer than a brother, the scripture says. He didn't come just to be a comforter, although he does comfort us. He didn't come just to be a counselor, although he makes a great counselor. He didn't come to just give us direction for our life, although he does. He came to be our savior because we needed a savior in a situation where we could not save ourselves because we were dead in our sins. And dead people can't really do anything to improve their situation. Jesus came to be our Savior. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But first, we're going to talk about the trouble with Christmas. And I'm not talking about the trouble that you're going to deal with when you try to find a parking place at Target today. I'm not talking about the trouble that you encountered whenever you got the Christmas decorations out of the closet and opened the box and you opened the one that said Christmas lights. <laughs> and they were a tangled, jumbled mess. And you remembered whenever you packed them, you know, one year ago. You thought to yourself, if I would just take some time and wrap them appropriately. It would be so much easier in 11 months, but you were in a hurry on January 3rd, and you didn't care, and so you just dumped them in the box, and now you're left to deal with that. I'm not talking about that kind of trouble. I'm not talking about the trouble that once you do get those lights out, you're going to realize that uh, uh, 30 30% of the stands, uh, strands all work, and 70% half work. I'm not, I'm not talking about that trouble. I'm not talking about the trouble um, that with Uncle Bobby when he comes and he, he drinks too much and then he starts telling coarse jokes and makes everybody uncomfortable. I'm not talking about that kind of trouble. I'm not talking about even the trouble that, that you'll discover on Christmas morning whenever you realize you forgot the batteries. Go buy some batteries now. I'm just, I want to encourage somebody. I'm not talking about the trouble that you're going to discover Christmas Eve when you realize that the gift that Santa brought um, was, was going to take a lot longer to put together than you thought it was. I'm not talking about that trouble. I'm talking about the trouble that went down 
on that first Christmas and the trouble then that we would be in without Christmas because we would be in trouble if there were no Christmas. In fact, help me out this morning. Look at, look at three people sitting around you and tell them, I knew you were trouble when you walked in. Come on, tell them. I, tell them. Three people. This is an all play. Find three people. I knew you were trouble when you walked in. Come on, Blaverty. Do it with me now. Come on. Come on, Midtown. The first troubling lesson that we are going to look at today as we unwrap Christmas is this. All presents aren't wrapped in pretty packaging. Not all presents are wrapped with pretty packaging. Sometimes the best gifts come in packages that don't look so good. Anybody in the house at every location, you actually love to buy gifts, but you hate wrapping gifts? Anybody love to buy, but you hate wrapping? All right, a few of you. Yeah, that's me. I will tell you that I enjoy buying gifts. I just hate wrapping gifts. I, I can't stand the process. I can't stand trying to get the paper out and cut it right, and the tape gets all messed up, and at the end, when I finally present the gift to Alicia, because I haven't even know the only gifts I wrap in my house are the ones for Alicia. Uh, she wraps all the other ones, um, but I, I wrap the ones for her. When I finally presented to her, it looked like a three-year-old wrapped the gift, and you think I'm joking. See, you think I'm being dramatic. Am I being dramatic, Alicia? No, it really looks like a three-year-old. Like if we were to wrap a gift here with me here and a three-year-old here, it's likely the three-year-old, it would, it would be just as good as mine. So that's why I thank God for the gift bags in 2022. Come on, somebody. There's nothing like the miracle of a gift bag. That'll preach this morning. That, that'll preach. And with a little tissue paper stuffed down in the top. Right? And, and just make sure there's plenty of tissue paper and gift bags, baby, if it's okay. Um, because that's what your gifts are going to all come in. Also, this one, like this style right here, I love this because it's kind of, you see that right there? See how cute that looks? But then all I got to do is put the gift down in there. I, I love this kind of stuff. I, I, love, I love buying gifts. I'm just awful at wrapping gifts. But here's what I've discovered, and I've tried to help Alicia understand. Even though I might not wrap it, it might not look pretty. Not, not all great gifts come with great Packaging. If you, were to, if you were to go to your office Christmas party and they were, they were playing a white elephant, and God knows that's my, I, I, I hate that game. That's my least favorite game in, in all, of, all of the world. I'm not saying it can't be fun if you got about eight people, but when you got 28 people, it's like, would this game just end already? Come on. Everybody just go get a gift so we can go, so we can go home. But, but, but if, you were to, if you were to be playing White Elephant and you were to be choosing between these two, you know, Gary, the one that Gary brought in the Target bag or the HEB bag that's inside of a Target bag, um, um, then, or, or the one that Brenda bought uh, and brought, and it looks like this, I mean, you, you're probably going to be drawn to this one. This is what we are attracted to, right? In our culture, we're attracted to pretty packaging. We're attracted to things that look that, that are shiny, that look like they're they're going to be significant. That I mean, I can I can hear something in there. It sounds significant. The packaging looks so amazing. A lot of people have got into a lot of trouble uh, in their dating life. I should use this again whenever we do a, a, a relationship series. A lot of people have gotten into a lot of trouble dating because they were so focused on what was on the outside. And didn't pay any attention to the character on the inside, the wrapping on the outside, and not paying any attention to the character on the inside. But we would, we would, we would be attracted to this box in that white elephant game, and we get our box and we open it, and then we only realize it's just a, it's just an apple. And as a matter of fact, somebody's already taken a bite out of this, this apple. Packaging looked great, but that's that's not so that's not so good. But then we were going we're gonna to look at the one, you know, that, that Gary brought. I mean, it's in this nasty, just this plastic bag, but inside this bag, oh, come on, somebody. Uh, there's an apple on here that has a bite out of it, too. But this is a little, this is a little more, this is a little more, a little more significant. I mean, I, I mean, we got, a, we got an apple, we got an apple, oh, oh, we got something else in here. We got something else in here. And this has got a, this has got a bite out of it, too. Packaging. In no way matched the contents. But so many of the greatest gifts that God brings about in our life 
and that he has always brought about comes with not so attractive packaging. But we got to be careful that we're not tempted to pass on an amazing gift because we're uncomfortable with the packaging. So this is what happened to Joseph, right? We've already read that Joseph was all about Mary. They were engaged to be married. I mean, they were headed down the right. But you gotta, you gotta remember, like they were, they were engaged, and so like they were, they were betrothed. Like they were, they were together. They had, they had not been together, um, but, 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 but they were, I mean, they, they were together. They, he was going to pick her up to take her down to Bed Bath and Beyond so that they could fill out their, you know, the registry for their, for their wedding gifts. And he picks her as he's picking her up. He notices on her counter that. There's some prenatal vitamins there. And he, he freaks out a little bit. Like, what is going on? I don't know that I want a two-for-one deal here. Like, I didn't know I was getting a package when I got you. I thought, I thought I was just getting you. So in verse 19, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. Like, even good people, like, even people who are trying to do the right thing can be frustrated or confused. By packaging sometimes that God brings into our life. He didn't want to disgrace her publicly. And so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Like he's heartbroken. Like this is a very strangely wrapped gift. That God was bringing into his life. He thought he had been cheated on. When as a matter of fact... He was about to have the opportunity. I mean, the packaging was frustrating and and confusing. But the gift inside was the savior of the world. He was about to be able to raise the son of God. Joseph was, was able to spend more time with Jesus on this earth than anybody other than Mary. Like some 30 years, he was able to spend time with Jesus, the Savior of the world, and teaching him things about life, teaching him carpentry, and teaching him how to fish, and he tried to teach him how to swim, and that just got weird really, really quickly. But Joseph discovered, listen to me, that that what was on the outside doesn't always match what's on the inside. And this happens to every single one of us. But Christmas teaches us that we shouldn't judge things based on just how they are wrapped. Sometimes we shouldn't be so hasty to just draw conclusions about some things that's happening in our life. Maybe some things that have happened to you in 2022. Or maybe some things that have happened to you in the last week. Instead of just pushing back from that, I want to encourage you to look again. Look at your neighbor and tell them, look again. Look again, that, 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 that relationship that you thought was the one and you wound up, it wound up being a breakup and where you see a bad breakup, God is showing you that it's a blessing and that it was for your benefit. Come on, sometimes God has to get some zeros out of your life in order to bring that hero into your life. That, yeah, that, that's worth clapping for. All those single people like, yeah, yeah, Jesus, that Those people that left you, the ones that lied on you, that made up stuff about you, that betrayal was a blessing in disguise because God was setting you up. He had to remove some things out of your life so that he could add some things to your life. God is really good at adding to our life by subtracting other things from our life. You, you might have got fired or you might have got laid off and you don't understand the packaging. That doesn't make sense. But God is setting you up for a much brighter future. I, I actually got fired one time. I got fired one time. I can't believe I ever got fired because I'm a really hard worker and all that stuff. But, but I got fired from a church one time, y'all. It's a long story in another part of the world. Instead of just saying, I got fired. We got fired. Alicia and I got fired. Okay. We got fired together. And, 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 and back then it was like, we were freaking out and I remember thinking, what are we going to do? And then we were, we're about to quit anyway, but what are we, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? But, but I got a phone call in just literally the day that it, that, that the situation happened the very next day, I got a phone call that set me up for my future. What I saw as, as tragic in my life, God was taking me into some triumph in my life and I wouldn't be the person that I am today and I wouldn't be where I am today and 
and, and we wouldn't, you wouldn't likely be sitting here today were it not for that moment in my life. So we got to be careful not to reject things that God brings into our life just because of packaging. And Joseph and Mary learned that that very first Christmas. The second trouble with Christmas as we unwrap the Christmas story is this. Sometimes our permission is rewarded with pain. Sometimes when we give God permission to work in our life, it feels like we are rewarded with pain. They complied. Mary and Joseph complied. One of my favorite lines of scripture, certainly in the Christmas story, I love this, I repeat it all of the time, is when Mary said, and it's always been one of my favorite lines because I heard it in a song years ago called Mary, Mary, Mary's song, and, and it was put to music. And, 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 and in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary says, Be it unto me as you've said. After the angel says, tells her what's going to go down, and you know you're favored, and you're going to have a child, and all of these things, Mary, in that moment, with like things hanging in the balance, she made the decision to comply with God's plan in her life, even though the packaging looked a little bit odd. She said, Be it unto me. As you have said. And so she's, she's full of faith after, after making this statement and Joseph accepting his assignment as well. And immediately their, comf- their, their compliance is rewarded with chaos. She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph goes to the mail one day and gets, gets the mail. And there's an unexpected tax bill. Anybody in the house have a little anxiety when you're getting the mail? When you're, when you're just kind of going through the mail? And I know we don't do tons of snail mail anymore, but there still is, I don't know, there still winds up being a stack of it in my box as I check it, you know, once a week. Um, but, but, you know, you'll be, you'll be flipping to junk mail, junk mail, junk mail, junk mail, junk mail, oh, North Rock, junk mail, junk mail, junk mail. And, and, and then you're like, oh, what is this? It says important, confidential. Oh, what is this? Uh, it freaks you out just, just a little bit. Have you ever gotten a certified letter? Certified letters terrify me. <laughs> Certified? What do, what do you mean I got to sign for it? Who's, who's the one that sent me something I have to sign for? Uh, or, or nowadays, I know we just get stuff in our email. But, you know, overdue, that might be the subject line or something. And you just, oh, that thing just kind of leaps up in, in your stomach. Well, this, Joseph gets this mail and realizes, hey, there, there's a tax bill that is, I didn't expect. And, and I can't e-file this tax bill. I've actually got to go somewhere. I've got to go to the town in which I was born in. And so Joseph and Mary have to go all the way to Bethlehem, which is some 100 miles away, to pay the bill. Couldn't leave me. She's great with child. And so they, they, they go together on this journey. It took a week to 10 days. Actually, and many people believe it took a lot longer than that. Can you imagine the chaos and the pain? They're traveling by foot and by donkey. And I I know that I had some rough vehicles back when Alicia was pregnant, but she never had to go to the doctor on a donkey. She never, she didn't have to come home from the hospital, Mason nor Britt, riding on the back of a donkey. But here's Mary and Joseph on this long journey. Can you imagine the nights? Can you imagine the nights on the journey when they're laying there thinking, really, God? Really? This is how it's going to be? And then they get to Bethlehem. They're dreaming about finally getting to Bethlehem and having an actual, you know, somewhere to lay down and somewhere to rest that's comfortable. And they get to Bethlehem and, and everybody else has come to pay taxes as well. So there's nowhere to park the donkey. Um, there's nowhere to park Mary. And, and the innkeeper's like, I got no room for you. The only thing you can do is go out to the stable. And, and, and it, was, it was a cave or a stable, a cave-like a stable that was pretty much probably in a cave where animals were kept out of the weather and animals were, were fed. And when baby Jesus was born, of course, the scripture says they wrapped him in, in cloths and they laid him down in, in a manger, which is essentially a trough for animals to eat out of. And I can imagine that as they get to that stable, that Joseph and Mary both are thinking, come on, God, really? Can't you just give us a little break? I mean, it's not like the birth of the Christ child took you off guard. I mean, you've known this was coming for centuries, God, right? He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 
this didn't catch you off guard, the least you could have done is just gone on you know, booking.com or, or Expedia or Kayak. There's all sorts of places that you could have grabbed us, you know, some, some accommodations, God, and helped us out. And here we are in a stable. Have you ever felt like that in your life? When you complied with God's plan, you wound up dealing with chaos? When you gave God permission, it just led to pain? And you wound up feeling stuck in a stable? Some of you kind of feel like that today. You just kind of feel like you are stuck in a stable. Why me, God? I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm obeying you. I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to do what you want me to do. Why is this happening? Why here? Why now? Why this? This happened throughout the scripture. The disciples obeyed the words of Jesus one day. He said, go across the lake. And they went out onto the lake and a storm came up. And they thought they were going to die. All we did was obey what Jesus told us to do. And now we're going to die. But how many of you know they did not die? The end of the story does not end with their death. And the end of your story, even if you feel like you are stuck in a stable today, it does not end with your death or your demise. The Savior of the world was about to be born. And listen to me. God is producing something in and through you. And even though you're struggling to see it right now, hope is coming into your world. Light is coming into your darkness. Joy is coming into your sadness. People who feel like you will never be able to smile again. Listen to me. God's got a word for you. Joy is coming. Joy is coming in the morning if you will just hang on. There's work to be done. There's some stamina that can only be built in a stable. And even though God has some blessing for your life, sometimes we want that promotion and God knows we're not prepared for it. And so he allows some things to happen in our life and he uses those seasons to to purify us, to prepare us, to help us process some things. Some of us, and I felt this yesterday, some of us are in seasons of silence. Seasons of silence right now. We've just been trying to do the right thing and it feels like we can't hear from God. Did you know that there were 400 years of silence before Jesus was born? Like between the Old Testament and the New Some of us think we're reading the Bible, you just turn the page from Malachi and there's Matthew, but that's not how it went down. There were 400 years where where there was no prophetic voice from God, no prophetic word from God, where as far as we know, God did not speak, whereas where we know that there was no scripture written, 400 years of silence, but silent, just because you're in a silent season, it does not mean that God is not working in that season. Because God was setting some things up. It seemed like he was saying nothing, that he has turned his back on everybody and everyone. And that may be what you feel today. But listen to me, God is still setting some things up for you. Stay faithful. Stay connected to the house of God. Continue to read your word. Get up and pray. Silent seasons, sideline seasons are not wasted seasons. During that 400 years of silence... The nation of Rome began, the power, the superpower of Rome began to flourish. And and when Jesus was born, Rome was in control. And there was a lot of evil involved there. There was a lot of bad, bad stuff involved there. And, And yet, God used evil to help prepare the way for the Savior. You know what? You know what? Of all the things that Rome did, one of the things that Rome was really, really uh, famous for was building roads. Rome built roads all over the 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 uh, the habitated world, the then known world. 
Like they built this crazy infrastructure all over the world. And you say, well, that doesn't, roads don't sound very spiritual. Well, if you'll go over to the book of Acts after the spirit fell and the church was born, the believers began to be scattered all over the world. And they took seeds of the gospel all over the world. You know what roads they used to carry that seed? They used the roads that those crazy, mean, evil Romans built. And even though you might be in a silent season, Let me offer this to you that God is likely, and I'm just going to say it, he is building roads for places that he wants to take you one of these days, like places that you never dreamed that you were going to go, things that you never dreamed that you were going to do. God does not waste our silent seasons. He uses them to prepare us so that we can produce what he wants to Produce Mary and Joseph experienced nothing but chaos from the moment that they complied. But how many of you know that anything worth worth producing in your life is going to require some pain? If the ladies in the building that have had children, you you've you've produced these beautiful miracles, but there were seasons of crazy discomfort and crazy pain. So often in our life, we seek comfort. We seek what's pretty. We seek what's comfort. But a lot of times when we seek comfort, this is what we get. It takes us uh, realizing that comfort is way, way, way overrated. Way, way, way overrated. And then God's like, okay, now I got you in a position that I can do something with you. The third trouble as we unwrap Christmas is this, that what we label as trouble is often taking us to our treasure. I know that 2022 might have brought some people in the building some pain. Some people watching online. I, I know the 22 might have brought you some plain, but I, I, pain, but I just, I just want to remind you. I want to let this truth remind you. I want to let the Christmas story remind you that you're in a posture to receive the promise that God has for your life. Like what looks like decrease in your life is actually God at work. He's adding by subtracting. What looks like a closing door is actually God. Sometimes we can't even find God until he shows up closing doors, right? He shows up protecting us by closing doors. Some of the greatest gifts that God has ever given me in my life is slamming doors in my face. From relationships in my life to buildings in my life to decisions about my future, God has slammed doors. And I was wondering, where, you, where are you, God? Oh, there you are. You just slammed the door right there in my face. God is really good at showing up, slamming doors. That house that, 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 that fell through um, could be God. That loan that you did not get, God, that health issue that slowed you down in 2022, God, that that health issue that caused you to slow down and kind of recalibrate and start to refocus on the important things in your life, God, when he, he got you back to focusing on your family and your kids, God, he got you back to focusing on, on his house and investing in his house and, and, and serving in his house and joining a small group. God, this is how God works. God uses our circumstances to position us, to posture us for his purpose to happen and be fulfilled in our life. And I just want to encourage you again, there's opportunity In the stable, if you feel stuck in a stable, God is not going to let you live with disappointment. He's not going to let you die with disappointment. God is bringing joy from this silence. He's bringing joy. And the fourth and final point today is simply this. As we look at the trouble with Christmas, as we unwrap Christmas, the fourth thing, we can easily miss the marvel We can easily miss the marvel, the miracle of Christmas. Because we get so busy and we get so troubled by Christmas. Running to and fro, we can miss the marvel. In journalism, there is a saying that says, don't bury the lead. And the saying simply drives journalists to be intentional about making sure that the main point of the article shows up in the first paragraph of the article. 
Unlike if you were reading a novel or, or you know, a, a story, a book, a fiction book or whatever. And, and it, it took you all the way to the end of the book to really see, oh, I see what's happening. As it relates to writing articles, they say don't bury the lead. Make sure that you get the point across in the first paragraph. Again, I think a lot of times with Christmas we miss the point. <laughs> Vince Lombardi is a legendary NFL coach. One of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time. Had his team on the field one Sunday afternoon and the entire first half, it looked like he had a bunch of elementary kids out there. And it was clear to him that they were missing the point. It was a big game. It had been all this media, all this hype, right? Fans. Signing autographs, lights, all of this, all of this cool stuff, TV, all of this stuff. But they missed the point. Like they forgot how to play football. And so at halftime, he decided to take them back to the basics. They need to go back to the basics. And so in his halftime speech, he walks into his team talking to a group of professional athletes who get paid to play football who most of them had been playing football their entire life. And he picks up a football and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. And he went on to explain the shape of the football, the exact size of the football, and how the football was made. And then he said, you know what you're supposed to do with the football? The point of the football game is to carry this thing or to pass this thing downfield until you get into what is called the end zone. And at that point, you score what we call a touchdown. And he went on to explain the game like in elementary fashion, exactly what football is, because he knew that in the middle of the game, because of all the hype around it, they had clearly forgotten what the point was. Every year at Christmas, I just want to remind you, all this hype, all of the celebrations, all the commercialization, all of the, all of the turkey and the presents and the lights and the music and the trees and the wrapping and the family time and the, and the in-laws and the parties and all of this stuff, all of the trouble that comes along with Christmas, all of that stuff, that's not the real reason for Christmas. Christmas does bring trouble into our hearts and into our lives. It can bring some chaos into our life, but listen to me, we'd really be in trouble without it. And the reason we would be in trouble without it is the real reason for the season. I've said for years, Jesus is the reason for the season, and, and I understand what you mean by that. But really, you're the reason for the season. Because you know what Christmas was? It was a rescue mission. It was a divine intervention. God coming to earth to rescue you, to save me. Galatians chapter 4 verse 3 says, and that's the way it is. That's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Jesus came, look at that, to buy freedom for you. To buy freedom for you. To buy freedom for you. Jesus was not an afterthought. Christmas was not an afterthought. The lamb had been slain before the foundation of the world. Before those 400 years of silence, there had already been some 400 plus prophecies about a Messiah that was going to come and be our Savior. You could go back and read them for yourself in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. Prophecies about Jesus to come. 
When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the seed for Jesus was already planted. Before you and I ever sinned, God already had a plan to save us. To save you. Isn't that amazing? It, it was a rescue mission. You are the reason for the season. And you know what? It's a lot more significant than this. But Christmas really is a lot like this gift of the iPhone. This is, there's nothing in this box. This is actually the box that my iPhone came in a few months ago. But what's interesting is when this, when this beautiful gift came to my door, <laughs> I sat it on my counter in my kitchen because I didn't have time to deal with it. I shouldn't have time to deal with it. And it sat there just like that in its packaging. I opened it and looked at it, but that was it. It sat there for about three days before I finally had the time to sit down and open it and activate it so that it could begin to make a difference in my life. Listen, the gift has come for you. The gift is, it came in strange packaging, but the gift is available to you today. There is peace that can change your life, that can calm the chaos in your life. There is freedom for those who feel bound in the room, watching online. There is hope for those who feel like they have no hope. There is joy for those who feel like they may never smile again. The gift is here. But you've got to do what I did that day when I called AT&T and they worked whatever witchcraft they worked and suddenly my phone went from not working to working. What you have to do is open up the door of your heart and allow Jesus in and activate that promise in your life. You have to participate by opening the door and letting him in. In order to get the peace, you have to participate in order to get that joy, that freedom, you have to let God activate it in your heart, and your life. And I'm going to pray in just a moment and give you an opportunity to activate that joy, that hope, that life, that purpose. Would you close your eyes all over the building? Come on at every location. Every location. Lord Jesus. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for this amazing, priceless, magnificent gift that even though it came in some unique packaging, Lord, it's made a, a difference in all of eternity for every single one of us. <laughs> if you're in the room today and you are not in a relationship with Jesus at any location, this moment is for you. Maybe you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. Or maybe at some point in your life, you were in a relationship with Jesus, but you know you've kind of stepped away and you're not close to him anymore. And you need to rededicate, to resurrender your life to him. This moment is for you. I want to encourage you to open that gift and let your mourning be turned to gladness. Let your sadness be turned to joy. Your hopelessness be turned to hope just by opening the door. He loves you just like you are. He loves you in your brokenness and your sin and your mistakes, your addiction. He just loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to bring healing to your heart. He wants to save you. So if you want to be included in this prayer, I want to pray for you. I'd ask for all heads bowed, all eyes closed at every location. Nobody looking around. Nobody looking around this sacred moment. But if you'd say, Jonathan, I, I need to make a fresh start today. I need to fully surrender my life to Jesus. Whether it's for the first time or you need to re-surrender your life to him. Will you throw your hand in the air right now? Come on, hold it high. High in the air at every location. Leave them there. I want to see every hand. Leave them there. Come on, hold them high. Leave them up, leave them up, leave them up. Hands all over the building here at Stone Oak. Come on, Boverde. Come on, Midtown. Hands in the air. Yes, yes, yes. I'm making a fresh start with Jesus today. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, you can put your hands down now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this along with me in your own words. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I'm inviting you to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. 
I repent today, Jesus, this Christmas weekend, 2022. I surrender my life to you. I believe in you. I believe you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today I want to make a fresh start. I want to make you Lord of my life. I'm giving you everything. Every room in my heart, every room in my life, I surrender all. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody said amen. Amen, amen. Would you stand with me all over the building at every location? Come on, let's stand. And while you're standing, go ahead and make some noise for everybody who just took that step of faith.